think we're going to get started. So, first, I want to just kind of introduce you all to the world and the ideas that are motivating this research. Broadly speaking, this work is concerned with two special types of things that exist in our world. Living creatures and computers. They share many important similarities. Both are able to sense and record things happening around them in the world. They can both also create their own actions and, create and respond to this information that they've taken in. And we call these senses and responses behaviors. We call them behaviors. <laughs> the intricate, reactive procedures of behaviors are shared by both natural living creatures and also computers, digital computers. It's these sophisticated behaviors that make computers and organisms unique among the rocks and the air and the other matter in our material world. There's a difference, though, that comes from how these creatures and computers are created. The context in which they are made governs the processes they enact. The animal's actions precipitate from the intermingling of forces of nature over billions of years. The computer's functions are developed by human social forces, and they also acquire idiosyncrasies from the context and the materiality in which they are built and used. Thus, the challenges presented by organisms and computers also differ. Ethologists, study, scientists who study animal behavior in the wild, they want to understand why the animals do what they do. Engineers, on the other hand, want to design more powerful ways for computers to engage with the world. Luckily, we can use creatures and computers to study each other. Computers' behavioral abilities can help us interact with and examine animals. And learning about the animals' behaviors can inspire new ways to program the digital devices. Putting them together, these comminglings of animal and digital behaviors can help us understand the design of both living creatures and computers. The problem is, though, that while animal behaviors are very old, computers are extremely new. We don't yet know all the good ways that, to arrange these configurations of creatures, environments, computers, animals, um, to be able to really make use of the new digital behavioral abilities that we have. And so this is the initial goal of this research. It's kind of a first foray into exploring ways to design computers to let us bring ourselves into nature, to let us better connect with and understand all the strange creatures around us. So, let's get started. Okay, my name is Andrew Quitmeyer. I'm a fourth year PhD student, and I'm presenting a dissertation about designing digital media for exploring wild animal behaviors. A written work has already been presented to the committee, and today I will be defending that dissertation. In particular, this research, which I refer to as digital naturalism, focuses on developing a critical framework to guide digital animal interaction design while supporting ecological values. The result is a design framework consisting of four key concepts. Technological agency, contextual crafting, behavioral immersion, and open-endedness. Today's research will discuss how this framework was developed. So we're going to set the stage for what all these things mean. We're going to build, build up towards it. So don't worry if you don't understand exactly what these mean right now. No one does. <laughs> um, so this, we're also going to look how to share practical evaluations of how these guidelines can be used in designing digital ecological tools. This presentation roughly follows the outline of the chapters of the written dissertation presented to the committee. First, I present this research's design space of challenges and research questions that lie at the nexus of exploring wild animal behavior and digital technology. Then, I share a hybrid approach for conducting this research, and I present the data collected from several years of studying scientists and technology. I then lay out the framework for how, uh, for, uh, how we can design good ecolo digital ecological tools I present an evaluation of this framework with both the committee or the, the uh, community and also with uh, real-world evaluation with hiking hacks, and finally then we have a conclusion. So 
Let's get started. First, to elaborate more on kind of our background design space between ethology and digital media. I started by researching a specific field of animal behavior studies called ethology. Ethologists study animals' behaviors in the animal's own natural environments. Founded by researchers in the early 1900s, such as Wheeler, von Frisch, Lorenz, and Tinbergen, it, like other sciences, strives to collect data that lets them draw inferences about the operations of the natural world. Since they conduct their work in the wild, however, these naturalists, as ethologists are often referred to, have necessarily developed their own unique principles which distinguish them from the other sciences and kind of allow them to try to tackle the infinite complexity of working in the wild, working in nature. For instance, ethology carefully balances empiricism and naturalism. Instead of striving for pure controlled data, like with uh, laboratory sciences, um, ethologists working in the field recognize the need for embracing ideas from romanticism and carrying out work that fosters the scientist's own intuitive abilities. As Leonard states in his Handbook of Ethology, valid research is conducted only by ethologists who have found a proper balance between empathy and objectivity. In the same vein, these foundational ethologists support curiosity and open-ended exploration and make use of all the tools and abilities that they have at their disposal. And they do this in order to invent new ways of interacting with and documenting all the living creatures that they work with. And they often deeply involve their own bodies in their own exploration. Here's Tim Bergen uh, doing some naked handstands at his field site. Um, and here's uh, Diane Fossey uh, using her own body to interact and engage with gorillas in the wild. So from this initial research of just foundational literature, we can develop a preliminary list of many important values that are specific to ecological practice, like motivations for being with non-human animals, pursuing open-ended inquiry, harnessing one's own intuition, and making your own tools. From this background research, I also developed a model of an ethologist process. They typically move in kind of an iterative cycle from openly exploring new research questions with their animals during their initial ex exploration. They refine these ideas throughout their experimentation and they finally share these findings in their dissemination. But this can go back and forth in many different ways. Uh, we will use this model later to study technology's effect in the different stages of their work. On the other side of our design space, I researched what new potentials digital media opens up with biology and behaviors. First, media involving biological components is a fascinating developing field but it has many still quite hazy distinctions between disciplines. For example, you can have biological media that is representations of or inspirations from animals, or you can have media that directly incorporates real living tissue or real living creatures. Since we're dealing with ethology, we can kind of narrow our search a little bit to specifically look at digital devices which deal with whole living creatures. This can help kind of focus this research a bit. And specifically by digital, I refer to Janet Murray's definition of the digital medium as its own unique means of communication and interaction. As she says, all things made with computer code or electronic bits and computer code belong to a single new medium, the digital medium, with its own unique affordances. Her four affordances are spatial, encyclopedic, procedural, and participatory. And when analyzing a digital artifact, she suggests mapping the relative uses of these affordances in kind of a visualization. Since an ideal digital tool would kind of fully utilize all of the affordances to their limits, um, looking at what the relative disparities in a real digital artifact are can kind of highlight important design considerations. So like mapping something like Microsoft Excel could kind of point out that, you know, it's good at storing data, kind of visualizing data, but it really doesn't allow for much participation or interaction. So this can help you kind of imagine a new kind of tool that could be a more interactive version of this kind of database software. If we apply her techniques to looking at how digital technology is becoming involved with studying animal behavior, we can begin to see that digital tools seem to have seem to have primarily been used to store and process data and haven't really yet been harnessing the digital medium's immersive or interactive qualities. What's more is that when we also look back at our model, one starts to kind of get, notice, get this feeling that most digital tools in ethology 
focus almost exclusively on ecological experimentation. And few digital tools are actually created to augment an ethologist's early exploration. So this discrepancy calls for this kind of main challenge of this research. Computers can open new abilities within a field, but as Phil Ogret points out, the vast new powers of digital tools make it likely to erase the important practices of the fields that it encounters. As he warns, computing has been constituted as a kind of imperialism. It aims to reinvent virtually every other site of practice in its own image. This means that computers often ignore the existing values of a discipline when they get kind of tossed into it. They can turn a science like ethology into a process of just speeding up or industrializing research. And it tends to force ethologists into the lab. Hey, come on, ethologists won't be running around in the jungle. Um, so instead, we will target the creation of devices that open up new ways for scientists to explore and understand the behaviors of their creatures in the wild. This brings us to the primary thesis of this project. By going out and investigating the key principles and computational utilization of current ethologists, along with finding guidelines for exploring animal behavior with digital technology, we can build a framework that will support digital ecological exploration. This thesis breaks down to these three research questions. First, what do current ethologists hold dear to their practice? What principles are important to current ethologists? Maybe everybody hates Tinbergen now in the field. Maybe nobody wants to run around in the field anymore. We gotta go meet who are the real ethologists now and find this out. Um, we also want to know how ethologists currently use digital technology. Maybe they want to get rid of all of it, no matter what. Maybe they're already really good at using all the affordances of digital media. Again, we gotta find out. We gotta figure this out. Um, we have, finally, we want to find what are the good features um, that make for designing a good digital ecological tool. So in answering these questions, will let us build towards a framework that guides the development of digital tools that do support ethological exploration from the ground up. To focus this work even more, the specific scope of this dissertation is on specifically ethologists studying animal behavior in the wild and looking specifically at their exploration phase where they develop their research questions. And we're hunting here for a framework that supports all of this with digital tools. So even with limited scope though, how are we gonna do all of this? <laughs> um, so there's a whole lot of stuff you gotta figure out when you start mixing up technology and ethology. Um, our intersection of fields kind of yields this wild tangle of material, scientific, and cultural factors. And because we don't know exactly how we're going to find what we're looking for in this very multidisciplinary project, we need to use a set of mixed strategies that are customized to probing our space between ethology and designing technology. So this research follows, first of all, a general paradigm of what we're calling qualitative action research. So qualitative research explores high-level questions that resist simple quantification, and it relies on having detailed and intricate descriptions of what people do. And this is really a pretty good, uh, uh, quite apt for our work, since really just replacing people in this definition would also give a pretty decent definition for ethology. Um, on the other side of this paradigm is action research, which is a type of academic research where theories are iteratively tested out in the real world with the goal of actually trying to bring about a change in the fields that you're working in. Uh, so, working with someone like Peter Martin, I'm not just studying what he does, I'm introducing things, I'm showing him how to do stuff, I'm influencing him, uh, and he's influencing me back. So this work could then be grouped under an even more specific heading of kind of science and technology studies due to its efforts to kind of understand the interplay between scientists, their technology, and the cultural factors that influence how they make sense of the world. Since ethology is a world then of customized tools, and situated actions, we also employ strategies from critical making and performance studies that concretely deal with tools and actions by leading workshops and performances that foster both analysis and discovery. Our definition that we're using for critical making uh, is modeled after Matt Ratto's initial workshops, uh, which target, as Kurtz notes, how hands-on productive work making can supplement and extend critical reflection. 
It does this by hosting participatory design workshops where participants collaboratively build functional tools while simultaneously discussing the implications of new technology on their work. This method of tying together work with concrete materials and conceptual reflection lets us both critically analyze the scientist's relationship with tools as well as discover new tools and techniques for studying animals. We also need to understand, though, what the scientists are doing with their tools. These actions that they carry out are influenced by traditions, cultures, animals, and the context that they're in. As science and technology scholar Kreese notes, what's primary in a scientific experiment is an act. And performance studies scholar Richard Schechner proposes a way of studying these acts, of these ritualized actions that the, that the scientists carry out in their experimentation and exploration. Um, he suggests being able to use performances themselves to crack open and analyze these actions of both the ethologists and the animals that they study. By encouraging them, the scientists, to conduct performances with their technology and the animals, these activities can help us analyze the actions they perform and also discover new techniques and behaviors of their animals. The specific methods that we're going to be employing include ethnographic case studies, questionnaires, along with directly engaging the scientists through critical making type workshops and physical activities involving science and technology. These techniques let this research deeply dive into the worlds of animal behavior and digital technology with the scientists. But then the challenge is how to analyze all of this stuff. How do we analyze all these experiences that we're going to be digging up? The anthropologist Clifford Geertz described the same problem in his work noting at the most down-to-earth jungle fieldwork levels of one's activity, the ethnographer is faced with a multiplicity of complex structures, many of them superimposed upon or knotted into one another. Geertz offered his solution through what he described as this process of thick description. And we followed a kind of formalized structure of thick description laid out by Descom for analyzing all of our qualitative action research. Um, so digital naturalism basically takes all of this data categorizes it, identifies important themes, and it iteratively presents these generalized ideas for validation by the peers in public. The basic idea is that after presenting you with all the details of this work um, and showing you how I analyzed it, um, you should be able to arrive at somewhat similar conclusions. So this research structure was carried out at the fantastic Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. It's an incredible place. And I was lucky to join the diverse community of scientists studying many different aspects of the tropical ecosystem. I sought to learn their ways of science, how they lived and worked together, and how their research developed and changed. I studied them in groups and also as individuals. And I completed this work over the course of three different field seasons. So let's get in the meat of this. First, what we did is we looked to study the activities and technologies of contemporary ethologists and discover what were the principles they held as important in their work. So we used questionnaires, first of all, to kind of look at the broad community of researchers at the Smithsonian. From the 50 questionnaire responses in the 2013 and 2014 field seasons, we can first see basic demographics that the participants hold a very broad range of experience from uh, beginning undergraduates to advanced <coughs> professors. They also study a wide variety of creatures with um, very different work schedules. There's always someone going to an experiment and someone coming back from the experiment at Stride. But their responses to the surveys indicate key principles uniting them. So like their ethological forefathers, like Tim Bergen and Lorenz, um, they all express common motivations for being in nature and with wild animals. And they also share their desire for doing this, being motivated by seeking discovery problem solving, and sharing their research with others. They all work on a spectrum between the lab and the field, and they all also tend to incorporate some observational and some interactive elements in their work. The ethologists are generally quite crafty, too, and necessarily build many of their tools. One scientist's statement tends to apply very generally that most field research involves a certain degree of craftiness. And they do this either by crafting tools fully from the ground up, like Barrett Klein's amazingly detailed robotic frogs, um, or by modifying industrial, commercial, and natural materials. What are the things that make them hatch? Yeah, what do they just grab? The embryos have to be able to discriminate what's a dangerous jiggle 
from? What's just the wind or the rain or some benign thing that's jiggling them? And they do, and they're very good at it. They don't respond to frequencies that are not present in predator impacts. Cool. So, as Workington noted, she explores this super interesting system of frog embryos that are able to basically sense vibration uh, from within their own eggs and hatch as a way of escaping predators. Uh, and she does experiments with a large programmable vibrator that simulates predator behavior. From interviews and shadowing her work in the field, Workington describes several key aspects of her work, particularly in relation to technology which again confirm many of the same principles of the foundational uh, forebears of ethologists. For instance, she prizes field-ready tools like textile cages, which can deal with the harshnesses and mobility needs of field work. Particularly important to her is how her lab identifies their work as being inquiry-driven, where instead of relying on a particular tool, they start with a question and develop tools and skills that are necessary to answer this question. To support this inquiry-based work, Workington's lab focuses on customized, handcrafted tools. As she notes, I study frog embryos, and that's not something that there's standard tools for. So thus, they often have to craft their own devices themselves. Like she puts it, there's lots of questions that, just in order to ask, they need to make stuff. Um, examples like these hand-blown glass or thermoplastic tadpole holders that they can kind of craft on site to meet the exact specific needs of, you know, different animal shapes and types uh, and how it's going to fit in with other machines. To speed up this arduous work, they must rapidly prototype and test dozens and dozens of iterations of their equipment on site in Panama. As Workington notes, if every design iteration requires a trip to Boston in between to manufacture something, she's based up in Boston, the U, um, it takes forever. Um, it's way better if she can rapidly proto stuff, or prototype stuff on location. Um, so finally, for Workington, the purpose of the scientific tools she creates, or science widgets as she calls them, is to embody a question. This requires open-ended designs, where she argues for making tools that are left open or unfinished, um, and having these parts connect with machines that have simple functions. For instance, they left the connection between basically this big vibrating machine and the tadpoles kind of unfinished until they came down to Panama and kind of built this thing because they didn't know exactly how they were going to hold the animals um, and how they were going to connect them to the uh, vibrator. And so this allows them to work with different animals, um, ask different questions, and basically reconfigure things in different ways and ask questions as kind of they develop. Thus, from studying Workington, we dug up many of the key principles uh, we dug up many key principles for ethological work. And from the rest of all the case studies and the community surveys, we found even more principles which resonate throughout the kind of foundational philosophies and contemporary practices that are common to many researchers. The key challenge for digital integration in these fields, though, is illustrated by analyzing Workington's digital utilization. If we map when and how she uses her tools, we can visualize this kind of digital dirt and exploration. She uses some digital tools to share and document her work, like that beautiful video we just saw, um, but mostly all the digital equipment is used for experimentation, uh, like her uh, tadpole vibrator. And this happens almost solely in the laboratory, as few digital devices actually accompany her exploration in the field. Looking at the affordances their tools use, um, we can see that they're primarily encyclopedic for storing and recording video data. And there's some procedural elements, too, in like her vibrational experiments. She can play back the vibrations recorded from different types of snakes or rain, uh, that kind of thing. But these tools present little spatiality or participation uh, for either the humans or the frogs involved. Um, and this is the kind of situation of most of the ethologists. Um, as seen in the sort of combined analysis uh, from the other case studies and the community surveys, it shows that when it comes to digital tools, um, it kind of solidifies our earlier, um, our earlier kind of hints that few digital affordances are being truly <coughs> used, and most of those that are um, tend to focus almost entirely on experimentation. The next section of this research looks to uncover design features which target these ecological principles 
while harnessing the abilities of digital media. We do this through hands-on participatory workshops, projects, and performances with the scientists. First, I ran some workshops. Um, I established the BioCrafting Station from very humble beginnings, just a, a box that I kind of hid in the corner and told people they could use the electronics. Um, but this kind of grew and grew over the years into a somewhat official center. We got like an actual room at the Smithsonian, which is awesome. And so here I held critical making style workshops with the scientists, like this firefly suit making workshop shown here, where participants could build wearable animal interaction devices while parallelly discussing cultural, social, and technological issues in their work. Overall, there were four main workshops of this type that we held, and where I did projects exploring some of the abilities of digital technology along with the principles of ethology that we kind of dug up earlier. And from this, we learned and solidified many important design features of the tools, such as letting the scientists practically engage with the technology, um, keeping tools open-ended in function, and making tools that help the scientists reflect on their own actions. For example, in that Firefly workshop, participants learned how to make and modify their own digital devices. Um, and they could use these devices out in the field with the lightning beetles themselves in the dark forest. And they could test and discuss different behavioral concepts that they were thinking of in, this experiment, in these experiences in the forms of emergent games that, and with the, they could start to play with each other and the insects. And it's these experiences with the animals, technology, and critical discussion that let the scientists kind of gain new insights about their creatures while granting them agency to understand things like that they're not just limited to just commercially available digital tools. So I also ran several independent projects with interested participants over the years. We explored many different topics like dynamic ant interaction with a leaf cutter Morse code messaging device, um, open-endedness and contextual feedback with developing a kind of low-cost ant sensors that were built in very close proximity to where they're going to be used. And we also looked at embodied sensory augmentation with devices like the Stereo Smelling Project to let scientists kind of feel what it's like to have an insect antenna. Once again, these projects tested and revealed more key features for digital ecological tools, such as the value of open-ended tools that raise questions, like the Leaf Cutter Morse Code Project, and getting rapid feedback by designing close to nature like we did with the modular hand sensor. Then, with the community as a whole, we also, or in sometimes in small groups, um, we also ran performances with the animals and some of their tools that they already had. Um, these were used to explore new interactions and behaviors with the creatures. For, for example, in the jungle fluids performance, we exposed jungle creatures to kind of a new foreign stimuli, ice and extreme cold. And the ants expressed new behavioral phenomena in response. They started freaking out and attacking this ice, and they kept up this fighting in ways that we've never seen them do with either other colonies or intruders or anything before. Uh, so it was very strange and cool to see. Um, other performances were made to kind of let scientists analyze their own early research ideas by having them act out their hypotheses for behavioral models. And they would use their bodies, digital technology, um, and sharing experiences with the animals and each other. These performances again illustrated the usefulness of design features like open-ended designs, getting feedback from nature, but they also highlighted the value of designing experience that promote embodiment and immerse the scientist's attention in these behavioral actions. So like those scientists that were scripted into the roles of Azteca ants uh, during the Leaf 5 Lover performance, who shared that it kind of helped them better understand the actions of the animals that they were looking at. So all this data collected from case studies, questionnaires, workshops, projects, and performances gives us a picture of all the values and needs that the ethologists have for their digital tools. From our ethnographic analysis and kind of summary, we confirmed that ethologists' use of digital technology is generally restricted to the experimentation stage of their work. And also that, of the digital tools that are used, they generally make little use of the full affordances of digital media. And this tends to be particularly true in ecological exploration. 
the literature analysis in chapter 2 and the ethnographic analysis in chapter 6 highlighted many values that were important to scientists for exploration, um, either historically or currently. And the workshops, projects, and performances in study in chapter 7, um, they also revealed features for digital technology that are important for the design of ecological tools. So this is really great information to have. Dozens of tested, valuable principles and features for digital ecological tools. However, this mass of ideas can be kind of unwieldy. <laughs> um, a framework for digital media um, and ethology is not going to be that successful if anyone trying to use it has to first read a 600-page thesis and always refer to a network of 10, 15 different concepts. So, we take, we take all these concepts and we try to group them, boil them down, into our finalized design framework for digital naturalism. It holds four basic concepts that can guide both ethologists and technologists to design digital media that can support ethological exploration. The first two parts of this framework concern construction, or how the tools themselves are built. Technological agency encourages the making of tools that are made to be understood, transparent, and also manipulable. Martin's Flickomatic is a good example of a device kind of epitomizing technological agency. He took our collaboration's initial prototype of a simple flicking machine and iteratively refined and developed it to meet the needs of his own research. And over the years of his development, he has even been trained others on building and repairing such devices. So some techniques for fostering technological agency and designs include developing tools that have simple functionality to begin with, especially functions that are adjustable and manipulable without a computer. Um, if you're out in the field, if you want your thing to start whapping twice as fast, you don't want to have to go back in the Arduino and change some delays or whatever. Um, and so often, this can come from, good technological agency can come from also just being forced to kind of make a tool oneself. This isn't really necessary. Um, contextual crafting, is the idea to build devices as close to where they're going to be used as possible. Making tools within the context of their own use speeds development and ensures that they're appropriate for the environment and the animals involved. Contextual crafting maintains a researcher's time in the field, letting them continue exploring. And since the tools are built in the wild, they can also be repaired in the wild, which is very handy for a lone ethologist stuck in the wilderness. Um, the modular ant sensor project shows some of the initial advantages of contextual crafting. Building it in a laboratory next to the rainforest in Panama um, allowed for continuous testing of dozens of different sensing methods in a very short time. We could fix or alter this device directly in the field, and its design was able to be refined by incorporating natural features, like attaching it directly to trees. Some techniques for contextual crafting are to do your best to shrink the gap between the design studio and the field site. And if possible, try to build directly in the wilderness uh, to ensure the appropriateness for the wild. Uh, or else iteratively create test tools in the field site, so just go back and forth between the field site as quickly and as often as possible. Making components with natural materials can also provide new insights and abilities for your tools. The second two parts of our framework concern the functions of what the devices are actually made to do. Behavioral immersion wants to deeply absorb interactors into the worlds of the animal's actions. It does this by creating inter interconnected actions between the digital, biotic, and human agents involved. The visceral engagement can empower an ethologist's intuitive analysis, and interactive systems can also try to immerse the animal new behavioral stimuli themselves, letting the scientists kind of explore dynamic experiments with the creatures. So an example would be the Living Lightning Project, which demonstrates how to achieve behavioral immersion uh, in very simple means. Uh, participants physically entered a dark forest. Their wearable firefly suits scripted their movements into new interactions with the forest, um, and also the human digital system could kind of symbiotically interact with the living fireflies around them. This project gave the scientists a glimpse then into kind of the sensory world of the insects. Um, they could also test out different patterns with the insects and see how they, re they respond to slight changes and variations in these blinking patterns they were exposing them to. Um, so, 
Some design technique, techniques that can let one create tools for behavioral immersion include mapping digital sensors directly onto a user's body instead of just uh, sending all the data directly to an SD card, you can do both. Um, and also embedding interactive elements in the environment or targeting kind of these cybiotic interactions that I mentioned, which can let digital and organismal agents kind of sense and react to each other. Finally, tools should be designed in open-ended ways that spur curiosity and undirected exploration through their improvisational use, open-endedness. A good example of an open-ended behavioral tool were the capacitive touch uh, animal detectors that we built in one of the workshops. Like Jay Silver's Makey Makey, um, it can connect to pretty much any kind of slightly conductive material, like a leaf or a puddle, and turn it into a proximity detector. It was very simple in function, um, easy to build, but it could also be easily tuned and adapted to many different scenarios. And it could, it could work with different kinds of animals, like big grasshoppers or frogs. And these improvisational tools like, really encouraged scientists to go out and rapidly explore lots of different configurations uh, and interactions with the local flora and fauna. Open-endedness. Um, so methods for fostering open-endedness in a tool include giving them simple functions that can be adapted and reconfigured quickly and left kind of partially unbuilt so they can be finalized once they're connected in an ecosystem. The components of this framework are not completely independent. As you notice, some kind of concepts kind of bleed from one to the other. And building towards one concept can often utilize and promote the others. So like building technology completely in the wild with contextual crafting, for instance, often forces one to have kind of good technological agency over one's tools, since you're all alone to begin with, or you have very limited other resources. Um, similarly, devices that create behaviorally immersive experiences might lead to creating more open-ended designs so that uh, they can work with different types of people or different types of animals. Continuing then, our action research methodology we weren't finished yet. We added an additional layer of testing to see and evaluate this framework that we developed in the real world, test out its usefulness. These evaluations were conducted by the community and also through rigorous testing of these concepts in the field. The community evaluation used the same sort of approach as before, of surveys and interviews, to get the scientists' opinions of the framework. We didn't have much time to go into the details, but they all saw the framework concepts and activities with them as quite beneficial to varying degrees, and indicated a willingness to continue such activities. The really big test of this research, though, was to push the ideas of the framework to their limits in the real world. I used the four concepts of this framework to design a new type of workshop called a hiking hack. It would combine the ideas and activities found in the earlier workshops to have the scientists collaboratively build and modify their own behaviorally interactive, open-ended tools. But in order to push the final concept, contextual crafting, to its absolute limits, we would try to do all of our design and construction cut off from any other human resources entirely in the wild with the animals. Uh, well, the basic model of a hiking hack workshop kind of looked, worked like this. With a group of ethologists and technologists, we would hike in multiple days into an isolated wilderness while carrying all of our tools. There we would kind of live, explore, build, and use digital de ethological devices, along with reflecting on these experiences and documenting I've already run, documented, and analyzed three of these workshop expeditions in Panama, Madagascar, and the United States. And once again, the participants analyzed these projects via interviews and questionnaires. They generally rank the four principles of this framework as quite necessary for good ethological exploration. Technological agency was one of the most utilized aspects of this framework uh, in this workshop because since the often inexperienced participants were kind of just tossed directly into building and programming their own tools. However, it's kind of weird. It was seen consistently as the least necessary principle in all the responses. But I think most of this critique stems from a miscommunication on my part. Um, most of the participants indicated that they thought by technological agency, I meant that every person had to have the full technical and biological knowledge of the entire situation uh, without any kinds of collaborations. And in fact, most of the participants suggested the actual definition, uh, closer to what we're trying to use it as, 
of trying to focus on collaboratively designing and building tools that are transparent and understandable by the users. Uh, from behavioral immersion concept of this framework, Hiking Act Project Jungle Insight Traffic Taster that we built in Madagascar, where a little ant sensor would start uh, taking in data from the ants crawling the trees and map this to your body via zapping your tongue. Um, the participants liked behavioral immersion, and it motivated them to make kind of more interesting designs, um, and they also said that it helped them kind of fold the human back into the real-time feedback loop uh, with the tools and the animals involved. Empowering the ethologist's uh, intuitive analysis and exploration was another thing that they suggested was a good part of this framework. Several projects also encouraged open-endedness in designs. The wearable ethogram machine, for instance, was simple in design, just a bunch of soft electronic buttons uh, that you could put over yourselves. But it could be easily reconfigured to log animal behavior, or you could log different kinds of trees that you're seeing while you're walking around, um, just different characteristics of the environment. So confirming the effectiveness of this component of the framework, the scientists had many remarks like that this concept was remarkably useful in encouraging improvisation, which can lead to novel questions, approaches, and answers. Building directly in the forest brought all the craziest challenges to these workshops. Heaviness, wetness, fatigue, scary creatures. Um, but the participants saw the pros of contextual crafting as greatly outweighing the cons. The participants felt that building our own laboratories, utilizing natural materials, and adapting to what we could manage in the forest fostered exploration of our surroundings, helped maintain kind of an inquiry-based research model, and rapidly sped up the testing and design process of these tools. Overall, these hiking hacks were a difficult but rewarding test of this framework. And they kind of stand as like this new weird way of doing research, which I think warrants further experimentation. Like their phone. Uh, also, in conclusion, Digital Naturalism's framework provides a successful model for supporting ecological exploration. The components of technological agency, contextual crafting, behavioral immersion, and open-endedness can effectively guide technologists and ethologists to build digital tools that foster ecological exploration. This research offers several new contributions and ideas while setting the stage for future work between digital and biological creatures. The current plans for the continu continuation of this work include a series of many more hiking hack expeditions already planned for around the world, uh, including Mozambique, uh, the Philippines, fingers crossed, uh, Yosemite, and Australia, more fingers crossed. Um, and I also aim to continue the professional evaluation and development of this work by sharing and analyzing with others, with examples in some upcoming invited talks, exhibitions, and conferences like at the San Diego Zoo, Ars Electronica, Iswick in Japan, and Forest in Denver. And that's all in these like, next couple of months. Um, so I want to thank Michael Nietzsche for being the only advisor who could wrangle all of this wonderful craziness. Um, and Kitty Kelly Quitmeyer uh, for being my wonderful wife and keeping me healthy and sane, mostly. And uh, I want to thank the rest of the committee for being fantastic. My digital media student cohort, you guys are amazing. All the Smithsonian people, all the Madagascar crew, all of the ants. Um, so uh, I had a couple PhD pro tips, but we're running on short on time. For the PhD. <laughs> so my one pro tip I'm going to leave you with is try not to start an open source sex toy company and end up in a major lawsuit during your dissertation defense. So try to avoid that if you can. <laughs> So now I'd like to know what questions and comments you have. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Can you give me a second? I'm just going to drink some water. <laughs> Do we have questions from the audience while wow. somebody speaks before you? Paul, oh. um, have you gone back yet you mentioned the four affordances and you have your four uh, framework elements. Um, have you looked back at how using your four framework elements changes the way that the tools that the ecologists use map onto the affordances of digital media? Um, it's not, not in, um, so Paul, I'm gonna, I can summarize uh, what the questions are for our internet people. You can all still hear me, right? Good? Cool. Um, so Paul was asking, 
about if um, if I've been looking at Murray's four forces and kind of my four components of this framework and seeing if uh, if then when the scientists are using these uh, four components of the framework, does that expand or change how they're using uh, their digital tools uh, in their kind of daily practice? Are they expanding the use of, of Murray's affordances in their work? Um, and yeah, we have. So a really good example of that was uh, Peter Marty. And so another reason that I decided to talk about frogs instead of ants today with Peter Marty is because we've been working so closely together uh, and that he started going kind of like uh, like me. <laughs> um, so we've been, we've been getting, he's been starting to develop his own kind of exploration digital tools himself um, and making new kinds of things. If you remember at the very beginning, uh, during the prelude, there was this kind of weird chirping, chiming noises. Those were actually a recent artwork created by Peter Martin uh, to kind of create this kind of immersive experience of being in uh, uh, his Cecropia ant nests. Um, so he, he tried to sonify um, all these colonies that he dissected and all the different tones refer to the different workers and stuff involved. And so when we were doing his analysis, his little chart of the digital affordances uh, started looking much more like, like a big fun square uh, than maybe just like a little inkling from one side to the other. So it, it looked like it has a fairly good impact in that way. Other questions from the audience? Oh, sure. Hey. Yeah, I'm not quite ready, but um, you know, I mean, you've sold me on performance, but and it seems to me that performance in, is in many ways, particularly the way it's practiced here in artistic pursuit, right? And so how, how does that work with science? In other words, I think you, it seems like it, it, they, they sometimes are uncomfortable together, right? Aren't they, don't they have different gain, uh, goals and epistemologies? Totally. Um, so, uh, to summarize Hank's question, uh, he was saying that I kind of sold him on performance, um, and, but kind of more in kind of an artistic way. Uh, would you say, like, you're thinking, like, of the performance more as kind of a reflective means? Well, I think, I think as a way of exploring the scientific principles, but I don't think that you're solely looking at it that way. So I'm just I'm wondering, so how does, it, how does it resolve if people are going out and they're creating art, or are they creating science, or they work at the exact same time? Uh -huh. um, so it ends up being this like wonderful blend, this wonderful messy blend of everything. So there's another, um, there's another performance that probably most people around the Smithsonian think was probably one of the crazier ones, where we all got naked and coated ourselves in jelly and then walked a couple miles through the forest to a waterfall. Um, so, you may, you may suggest like, okay, that seems like, you know, a weirdo performance, where's kind of like the science coming involved? Uh, so, from the feedback that we got from the scientists, uh, a lot of them remarked about how there's so many things that they didn't notice from doing this really weird action out there. One important thing was just the simple fact of not having much clothes on um, made you realize how much extra noise and stuff you're bringing into your field sites when you're supposed to be doing your kind of kind of more objective like scientific transects. Um, they realized like we walked right up to like a deer that was just in the middle of the forest. And a lot of the ethologists remarked about like, oh well, you know, just having my giant boots that I use every day, it could be kind of like scaring away certain animals that I'm not really paying attention to, kind of skewing the data in those kind of forms. So a lot of these actions, they can be used for like the leaf five lover thing, kind of like reflecting on ideas that they have for their science, but then also just kind of encouraging them to do strange, to introduce new behaviors into this ecosystem that they've been doing the kind of same ritualized behaviors over and over again. And help them kind of stand back from this and give kind of a fresh perspective and look at what kind of hidden variables they may have accidentally been adding in the whole time. Does that kind of get to what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks.
girl, if you don't have further questions from the audience, can we move to the committee and see whether they have particular questions for the, for the, for the online folks? Yeah, sure, start with the online. Turn this light off 
Um, and I'm like, yes, I can. I can even make it turn on again, and we can tell it how fast to turn on and off again. And so, like, even really basic things, like a blink sketch, um, that they're starting to share with each other, um, has been really rewarding. And really, this has been a, a big reason of why I started this research to begin with, is because I was working with Stephen Pratt, and we were trying to do this sophisticated bio-tracking uh, with computer vision. And I just, I felt really bad all the time, because it was really hard. <laughs> and it was really hard to make these programs work that well. And I didn't want to let the scientists down. But then I realized, like, I didn't, I was running out of time myself to, like, you know, I can't be, like, tech support. So I decided to kind of reframe this all and try to dive into, instead of working next to the scientists and just giving them kind of, like, goods that they can use in their research, I wanted to more so just teach them so that they could be independent and start kind of spreading this themselves. Um, and I was told recently they held a robot party uh, down in Gamboa, where everybody made weird light-up costumes, uh, thanks to Peter Martin. Uh, so that was super cool. <laughs> And I might have a question that relates. Um, so I realized that you you focus on the exploration phase because doing the whole procedure would just be too vast and, and too long. Understood. Um, but looking at the, the other end, um, would you kind of touch a little bit on the dissertation that's here, a particular dissemination? When, the, when your scientific model goes from complicated to gradually more, more abstracted, again to a complicated, open-minded dissemination. So I, my question basically um, relates to for whom is this and how can they de deploy that. Um, can the same framework be used at different ends of your model, like the open-endedness particularly, and the, the create tools with no fixed function approach, for example, as, as a subsection of a design plan? Um, if you apply this, don't you dilute findings into, I don't know, shows almost? Like how do you avoid um, a counterproductive use of the same framework at a different end of, of the whole thing? It's more like a projection because you haven't done that work, but I would like to know how you stand. Yeah. Cool. So, Michael's kind of starting to ask the question of like, okay, we've got this framework for digital exploration with ethology. What about kind of the other parts, especially like the dissemination side, um, but the other parts of kind of this model of ethology, experimentation, um, dissemination, exploration. Um, how, how can this framework kind of map on there? How can it kind of expand that? Um, and are maybe are there other things that maybe need to be added to keep it from being, from diluting this framework too much? Is that what you're saying, Mike? Yeah, well, diluting the data. So at that time, the scientists will have data, but uh -huh. present it without actually diluting the knowledge. Gotcha. So I'm going to split that up into two questions. Uh, the second question of uh, diluting the data, um, what I would say is, like most of these things, um, you don't have to get rid of the super empirical size. Um, you can make a crazy, behaviorally immersive costume that you wear around mostly naked in the forest while you're logging all kinds of data. Um, the main thing is, is I just don't want all of the kind of fun stuff, the experiential stuff that gets the human's mind working to be completely thrown out. So I don't see the framework as much as diluting the data. And on that same point, when discussing how would this framework kind of be reconfigured for uh, like more of the entire process of the ethologist, I, I begin thinking about this. And I've suggested different types of kind of prototypical extra framework items that could be added to ex uh, experimentation and dissemination. But I think that of the four that we have now, I would only add one more element to the framework for the entire process. And I would say that would be to, in experimentation, to aim to design devices that offer um, 
repeatability, um, like refined repeatability. Because that, that gets down to the kind of empirical nature of not diluting the science involved. Making a device that, it might be open-ended, but if you tweak it like this, it's going to do exactly this every single time. And so things like uh, Peter Martin's tool, when he developed this flickomatic from going from just this weird little thing that we tapped the tree with, and he started moving it himself into his own experimentation, it became an official part of his experimental research, um, he had to focus on refining the repeatability of this tool. And so that's the main additional framework that I would add on to this. Making your tool go from this weird kind of flapping thing to like, it's going to strike with roughly this many newtons of force um, and this uh, precision kind of thing. So precision, repeatability, that's the, the final part that I would add to this framework. Cool. Carl's got two questions. Um, so the first question uh, comes from the title Digital Naturalism. Uh -huh. And my question is, to what extent does the digital really matter here? Um, to what extent could you not have just called this uh, media naturalism or performance naturalism? Um, because, and, and I want to preface, you, you, no, I actually don't care what the answer to this is. So, uh, perfect. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to make some claim about the digital. I'm asking you if there is a claim about the digital being important here. Because, in fact, you know, the aspects of the digital that are often used in science, particularly the encyclopedic, is, is, is actually not here, right? It's, it's written out of these things. And so, to what extent is the digital important? Or could it, this have just as easily been called um, media naturalism? Performance naturalism, and does the would the framework still hold? So, is there anything important or particular about the digital here, or is it just that the digital happens to be a convenient kind of tool set in 2015? So, for our internet friends, um, Carl asked a question about to what extent does the digital matter, matter, digital naturalism. Could it just as easily be a kind of media naturalism or performance naturalism? Um, why do we need the specific digital parts? Or is it just that I'm a digital media uh, PhD student and thus got to work in computers? Um, uh, so what? why does the digital matter? Um, and it doesn't matter. Will this framework still hold without the digital component? So. The main reason that I include the digital part here is it kind of relates to my, my prelude, uh, where I think that there's a really interesting thing that's happening where we're trying to study behaviors on one side, on the naturalist side, and then now we have this amazing new thing that can actually do behaviors itself. And so that, I think, is one of the really fascinating parts of digital technology. And that's why I really want to incorporate and explore what computers can do um, in this naturalist world. I would say that in building this framework thus far, it hasn't afforded me that many options to really get to explore many of these concepts to their fullest extent like I would really want to. I, especially the behavioral immersion concept, and I think that's where most of this digital comes in, of being able to take actions and responses from the digital and biological components I think that can get really explored a lot further and make for a lot more interesting uh, networks of living creatures and uh, digital components that can sense and react to each other and kind of play with each other and learn about each other. Um, so that's one reason for incorporating the digital part. The other side to that is again goes back to my, my worry about the influence of digital technology is already being forced into many of the sciences. Um, you can see many people would be telling me about you know, grants where they have to kind of work in, or you know they want to work in, uh, maybe a collaboration with engineers or people doing digital devices. Um, and that, that can bring a lot of problems with it too. Uh, and so 
that's the other side for making this digital naturalism is trying to avoid the, the big computer bulldozer from coming in and destroying all this beautiful naturalism, ideas, and engagement with animals. Sure, same question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because they also the same question, it might fit into what Carl, Carl will ask. Okay. But, uh, so when you create these, these beautiful networks, these naturalistic things, with the digital and the scientists and the, the tree frog. Um, I see where the designer and the ecologist stand. I get a pretty good idea where the environment stands. Um, where does the animal stand? So, so what is when, when, when you create these, these guidelines um, and when the digital comes in as a behavioral element, how, where does the animal stand in relation to the to that behavior, to the action, to the act, to the performance part? Or not even perform, like the act. I think so. let's focus on the word of act or actual. Uh, where does the, the the animal stand? Is it because you say it's like a cool player at some point in the dissertation, for example? How do you include that? So, so repeat his question for you real quick. Um, Michael Mitchell was asking, you know, you have, in the framework, you have kind of where the ethologist stands, where the uh, designers may stand, where the tools, where the environment kind of is, but what's the role of the actual animals involved in this whole mesh of stuff that we got going on? Um, to what, you know, what extent is the framework kind of like having them as a co-player, or is it also just, you know, forcing all this stuff kind of on them? I would say this is another component uh, that I feel I really want to explore a lot further, is making the animals themselves a much bigger uh, participant in all these things. Um, and I think that goes with creating these kind of like devices that can kind of sense and react back with each other, digital, animal, kind of behavioral, immersive things. Um, but so far, um, yeah, I kind of, I kind of regret that I haven't been able to to really engage with the animals as much in, in current projects and stuff like that. But I would say that the target of this sounds good. Right, Carl's got a second question. Uh, so one of the things that I've often asked you about is how does this contribute back to the fields that you're drawing from? And you've got some sense of how you're hoping it contributes back to the college. But my, my question is, is, so in the process of doing this work, what did you discover about 